Howdy, howdy friends, Alicia Latrice here. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. In today's video, I will be discussing the egg retrieval process, my overall experience, the recovery time, PGS testing, and the results that came back from the PGS testing for my embryo. So make sure you are subscribed and tune in for more. Oh my goodness, like the consultation phase is completed, stimulation phase is completed, and now I've just completed egg retrieval and PGS testing. I cannot tell you how excited I am that I've now been able to send the embryos that were retrieved from my body for PGS testing. Um, and for those of you who are unaware of what egg retrieval is, it's where you are sent to your facility. It's about a 45 minute procedure where you are placed under anesthesia and the physician will use the ultrasound to navigate through your left and right ovaries and retrieve the eggs from your body using a needle. And once all of your eggs are retrieved from your body, you are then you are then sent to a recovery room where they'll monitor you for about 30 minutes to an hour to see how you're weaning off of the anesthesia. And then your your embryos are sent to their first babysitter, which I say is the embryologist, who monitor your eggs every day, day over day to see what the progress is, which eggs are maturing and which ones mature to the stage, the stage where at day five, they become blastocysts. And what that means is they are now fully fertilized, fully mature and can be frozen to do a fresh embryo transfer, a frozen embryo transfer um, to just put on ice when you're ready for transfer and or frozen and then sent for PGS testing. So before I had the egg retrieval, the nurse called me 36 hours in advance and that's when I pulled the trigger which I talked about in the previous video of the stimulation phase and the trigger shot. And when I pulled the trigger, all that did was release my egg, it pretty much gave a note to my uterus to release my eggs which prepared it for my physician to do the egg retrieval. Um, I was informed not to eat anything or drink anything no later than 10 p.m. the night before and I could not take myself to the clinic just because I was unable to drive myself after the procedure was done. So um, I had to be there by 6.30 a.m. and me and my sister went and we had my um, niece and nephew with us as well. And so we dropped them off to my cousin and then my sister was able to go into the recovery area where I was uh, fully prepped. I had to put on the, the you know, the hairnet. Um, they gave me a diff different kind of face mask to place on, um, some feet coverings, as well as a gown. And so I was in the recovery room maybe five minutes before they took me to the operating room where I met with the anesthesiologist who came and kind of chatted with me. Um, did my ID kind of talk through what the anesthesia process looked like and how you know I would recover after that I would say I was not in the operating room no more than about 30 minutes um, and I pretty much woke up the funny thing about how I woke up is they were rolling me back. I was on the, the bed that was in the operating room and they were rolling me back into my room and somehow the nurse staff could not navigate me into the room appropriately. And we kind of like crashed into the room door and I like, it, I was so startled and somehow I instantly woke up and I remained um, awake since that point. I was up drinking water um, and it pretty much, it felt okay with the water going down. I wasn't nauseous. I was just in a lot of pain. I felt as though someone had taken a hammer and was like just beating me um, in my uterus area, like down there. It just, it hurt. It just hurt so bad. Recovering from egg retrieval is supposed to be very painless, uh, very speedy recovery. Most women go back to work the very next day. Um, my restrictions, my kind of instructions were not really kind of strict at all it was I just needed to make sure I was resting and on bed rest for at least two to three days that I did light activity and just allowed my body to recover on its own and not force myself to go work out or to overdo it um, a lot of women go to work the very next day and continue with your normal day to day however my recovery was the complete opposite i look back on it and i still can't believe i experienced what i did um 
when going through the recovery phase. So the first thing that I struggled with the most is I had not had a bowel movement for 14 days. Um, it was the worst feeling ever. I was so frightened to eat. I felt entirely terrible. My stomach, of course, my ovaries were just enlarged. I just went through this, you know, this surgery to have them retrieved. So it's just extremely sensitive in that area. And on top of me not having a bowel movement and unable to go, it made it 10 times worse, guys. I didn't want to eat because at this point I was just like, oh, you're just eating this food and nothing's coming out. You, you have no way to release. And I felt that it wasn't coming out the back, so it was going to come out the front. I was taking tons of laxatives, tons of stool softeners, as well as Miralex, Miralex every day. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. I then um, even went and did... Um, some people call it a flea, some other, you know, it's just where, uh, look it up. So I even did that and there there was no luck there. And so on day 10 is when I reached out to my fertility clinic to inform them of the issue I was experiencing. And so the nurse in charge met with the doctor and they informed me to discontinue taking laxatives, to continue with the stool softeners and with the Miralex. Um, still no luck. And I, you guys, I was miserable. Not being able to poop had to have been so tough on my body. And I just felt, I just felt so sick. And that was the first thing I struggled with after, like during the recovery process. The second thing is um, I suffered from OHSS and I was extremely bloated, extremely nausea. I was vomiting like crazy. Um, and what this is, is it's something that typically happens to a lot of women who undergo IVF when you are pumping your body with so many um, hormone medications to get, you know, the eggs to, to, to grow at rapid speed and to mature at rapid speed, that sometimes in turn, you have additional side effects. So my bloating didn't dissolve until maybe almost four weeks after egg retrieval. And typically it eliminates between at least seven to 10 days after egg retrieval. And for me, it was almost closer to a month um, where I was still very sensitive in that area. I was very nauseous. I was still throwing up. That's my niece screaming in the background. She's in her room and they're playing toys. Um, so with OHSS, I had never even heard of it. All the kind of IVF support groups I'm in, all of the, the research I've done, no one had mention experiencing or battling OHSS. So of course my mind was going rogue um, because I just didn't understand the the side effects that I was having during my recovery process. And so because I had extreme ten tenderness in my ovaries and I, you know, have been nauseous and then prior I was unable to have a bowel movement, um, is when my clinic had me to come into the office because now they're trying, this is when they informed me I had OHSS and um, had placed me on additional bed rest. So a total, I would say at least the full month after egg retrieval, I was on bed rest, um, trying to get my body to detox and trying to just fully recover um, by having regular bowel movements and really um, just kind of supporting my body with the ovaries shrinking and the tightness in my, my abdomen area to kind of not be so tight and kind of everything going back to normal. So during the egg retrieval phase, I had 20 eggs that were retrieved from my body. Um, after day one, three of them ended up not making it past day one, which left me with 17 that were fertilized and then monitored over the five day period. So over the five day period, I was then left with 11 embryos that were fully mature and fully ready to be sent for PGS testing. And PGS testing, actually, when they made it to day five, the um, lab immediately sent them the same day to the PGS testing site that I utilized. Um, and it took about 10 days for me to receive the, the results from there. So I sent 11 that were just kind of fully mature, fully fertilized, and just ready to go for PGS testing. And when they were sent, I had four out of the 11 that were, two were abnormal and the other two were low uh, Mozak. And so what that is, is the two abnormal means that 
they came back and they would not be a good fit to move forward with with transfer there was some type of uh, abnormality with them the two low mosaic is where they they pretty much when they do the pgs testing they're testing the placenta around the the, the, the placenta to understand if it's normal or abnormal they don't do the embryo itself because they don't want to damage your baby um, and so with that is I could have I could have still used those and utilized them because we don't know if it was just a placenta the placenta that was abnormal and the the embryo itself was okay it was just and the fact that it was on the lower end that means out of all of the characteristics that it had that maybe if say for instance there were just a, a total of five five that they look at it would have been that three were normal and two were abnormal so that was still a great turnout but with the um the rest of the results that i got back from pgs testing i have seven normal embryos and i am an ecstatic happy excited mother of four little gals and three little guys um and that's so amazing to me because i will put my babies on ice and have them frozen until I'm waiting, ready to use them for transfer. And what I'm doing for transfer is I am going to do an anonymous transfer so I won't know if I'll have a boy or a girl transfer because I am going with the strongest embryo out of the seven to transfer this first cycle of IVF. So now that egg retrieval is completed and I have my embryo test results back, I am now on estradiol patches for the next two weeks. And what estradiol patches are is I place three uh, patches on my abdomen area and it's a um, hormone that is supposed to support my uterine lining um, become thick. And of course, a thick uterine lining is key for transfer because of course your embryo wants to cuddle up and snug into a thick uterine lining and it lowers your risk of having a miscarriage. And so I will be continuing to prepare my body fully by having tons of pineapples, tons of pomegranate juice, um, eating a well-balanced diet and um, working out as much as my body can now that I'm recovering uh, fully from the egg retrieval process. And what happens during the third week is I will continue with the estradiol patches, but I will um, include PO to the party. And what PO is, is progesterone and oil. And it's another hormone that is due to support your entire uterus for implantation. So it really just prepares your um, uterus for uh, embryo transfer. I cannot thank you guys enough for tuning in. Make sure that you go watch my previous videos, IVF stems, as well as my IVF journey and the consultation phase when I initially started this journey. The next video that I will be uploading will be IVF embryo transfer. Like that is the final phase within this IVF journey and I'm super excited that I've made it this far. It has been an emotional roller coaster and I've had my my breakdowns. I've had my moments where I just felt I couldn't continue to press forward. And at the end of the day, my precious babies were and are always top of mind for me. And I know at the end, it will all be worth it. So make sure you subscribe, you hit that notification bell so you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. And I will be talking to you guys soon.